Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll keep some of that in. I don't know how much. Maybe all of it. Maybe none of it. Um, <laughs> welcome to a very special episode of Duncan and Bo Come Correct. I, of course, am Bo Ranstall. With me, as ever, is the the multi-talented, the multi-hyphenate Duncan McLeish. And hearts for everyone. Because we're not doing slasher. For one episode. And then no, I will take it, Bo. I will take that one. I will cling on to that one episode as if I were like off the Titanic, adrift at sea with only one lifeguard to hold on to. I'll never let it go, Bo. I'll never let it go. Uh, well, ever since you said cling on, I thought, <laughs> boy, that's <laughs> that Star Trek you, 3 is underrated, is what I thought. You, did you think, Takba, Takbe? Um, Gazunite. Um, Oh, Which what what it what, what is that? What does that mean? I'd say that's um, from the undiscovered country. That's part six. Oh right, that is uh, a good that's one. Christopher Plummer saying that you let us the original Klingon for yeah, it's to be or not to be. Yeah, that's right. Hamlet and the original Klingon. Um, <sighs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm I'm in a, a hole of geekdom right now that I didn't want to be in so early in this recording. <laughs> uh, well, you know that's where we were headed anyway, and and honestly, part six, one of the finest Star Trek films you're ever going to see. It might be the best. It, it might be the best. It's either two or six. I would not dispute that. I think it's either two or six. Yeah, because they have great villains, and it helps mm-hmm. when one of your villains is, you know, Khan. <laughs> And the other one is Christopher Plummer. Right. And kind of dealing with interesting ideas too, you know, uh, like the whole thing in six with, you know, Shatner looking down the barrel of retirement and all that stuff. And it, it kind of mirrors what was going on too, where he was sort of aging out of starship command. Mm-hmm. Anyway, as uh, the, that's for another <laughs> podcast. Um, <laughs> one of these days we'll do star Trek two and six. Yes. Um, but uh, for now, what we're doing is we're doing another Duncan and Bo and Duran Duran, where we are going to just kind of kick back. We're going to listen to some Duran Duran. Uh, this time, the album is going to be Rio. Uh, didn't sell well, didn't do well. There was, was no great singles from this one at all. <laughs> was not a popular record. And and so here's how it works: is we're going to kind of listen to the the music and and kind of chit chat uh, over it and about it. Um, as well as just kind of give our thoughts on, on the music, uh, the individual songs and the album as a whole. If you're watching this on Patreon, you're going to hear all of it. Every, (laughs) every little bit of it. If, uh, you are watching this on YouTube, then that means that we have cut all the songs out for copyright reasons. We do not want to be smoked. No, I do not want to be Simon LeBand. (laughs) <laughs> yeah dude that one get you uh that's a good one <laughs> so uh so what we'll do is you'll you know we'll start the song and it'll kind of fade out and then we'll come back and and talk about the song um so that's it and then uh in two weeks time we'll be back to our usual hijinks as we dive into slasher season three uh where the the villain is the druid I think is the the killer in season three. I I, um, I, I I got the name earlier on for it. Um, it's solstice, uh, yeah. So that okay. that would be right. It's slasher season three, slasher solstice, and apparently the killer is known as the druid. That is literally as far as I know because as soon as I heard that, I went, oh no, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, I finally see the trailer for that season four, though, and I did mm-hmm. in that trailer see two clips of the Cronenberg, and he looks like he's having a ball. So I, I'm very curious. We're only uh, ten episodes, I guess, eight, ten episodes away from uh, discussing that. So mm-hmm. uh, we'll see. We'll get there. Uh, um, all right. Well, Duncan, let's uh, let's jump into this. This is, of course, the second album uh, from Duran Duran. Came out in 1982. Um, so, uh, Rio, of course, is what I'm talking about. It's kind of after the first album, which was really interesting. It was a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but not what you would consider, you know, a banger of a Duran Duran record. There's good stuff on there. Still a bit 
It's still a bit experimental yeah. towards the back end. So, like, you you illuminated the listeners to the fact that they were, for all intents and purposes, kind of avant-garde and prog before they really started to become a pop band. And the hangover of that is definitely on that first album. It is all but gone on. I mean, they're still experimenting with some instrumentation and stuff. So we are still going to get a little bit of fun stuff to talk about on here. But this is where the band kind of found the formula to make a hit single. Yeah. So. And and did it happened to make several yes. <laughs> from this very record. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Once they had that formula, but it turns out they could recreate it quite easily. So yeah. yeah. Uh, the, this was, of course, uh, you know, the producer that kind of found them and started to be like, "Hey, you know what you guys need to do is be pretty, sing weird songs." Yeah. And I think we really got something here and we're going to clean up the production. We're going to make it a little livelier, a little peppier and mm-hmm. if this prog rock bullshit, you, you are going to be a new wave pop band. Yes. And yes. Right. When new wave was just hitting. Yeah. They're on the cusp. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, these were the, the new romantics. This is the, the, the very tip of the spear, mm. uh, if you will, of that, uh, that kind of, fashion style and that sort of music so without further ado duncan yes we're gonna do a countdown listeners if you want to listen along here we go we're gonna go three two one and then we're gonna hit play and track number one by the way uh for those at home keeping score this is the 2001 remastered edition of the album uh doesn't contain all the demos and stuff so we're just listening to the remastered versions of the the original songs so uh, we're going to start with Rio track number one, starting, uh, with a bang. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do it. Three, two, one, Rio me, baby. Here we go. When in Rome, bo. <laughs> or Rio, <laughs> when in Rio, bo. <laughs> when in Rio. Uh, and there you have it. That is track number one. That is Rio. Um, again, just a banger starting with starting with a showstopper duncan yeah now you give you give like we said uh, during the recording you give a little bit of a feed in where you're kind of still doing a little bit of the fuckery from the end of the last album but then you cut it right off you hit us with the happiest genius disco beat um it's a fast-paced song slow verse vocally um catchy as fuck chorus i mean like it is it's a total earworm you're going to be singing it like for the rest of the year, and um, if you're in the club, you or the discotheque, <laughs> um, you're gonna want that song fucking played all the mm-hmm. time. Um, loads of instrumentation, bitchin' bass. Like th- this album is a bass player's album, uh-huh. and it, are you just get just get used to being constantly wanting to say, "I want to learn bass." It yeah, it's cool. The in the synth is not, it, it's <laughs> not the simple arrangements that. Yeah you know like of a van halen or something you yeah know? it's also not driving the music this time in the previous album it was listen to this weird synth sound i've picked mm-hmm. i'm going to play it for a minute then the band's going to come in that's kind of gone here it's it's still playing like arpeggios and um kind of weird loops but it's doing it in a, a way where it's controlled in the mix and it's actually benefiting the song it's the backbone to a lot of it as opposed to being well what do we do now weird noise <laughs> like, meow and there we are like digital cat meow there we go like, yeah that's not here so yeah it yeah right we're gonna push a trash can down some stairs <laughs> we're gonna weave that into the end of the song it, we, yeah it's it's really interesting. It's very different between verse and chorus. Like I said, the it's got a weird bridge that I really love. Saxophone solo. A saxophone solo in this song, and I don't. I again, I can't. I'm not gonna say no to that. Yeah, what, they, I mean, it's not. It's not an instrument you would usually associate with Brazil, but I love the fact that it's in here. Look, uh, the only thing that the song is missing, as far as I'm concerned, is a cello solo, <laughs> which would have been great. <laughs> um s- all right chill chill um, rio i, I doff doing. my cap to you opening song it's, it's like oh you play the cello you turn it on your side and guess what chill you got a bass <laughs> um skill of rock man it's awesome. a great it, it, hey i watched it 
within the past 18 months and had a perfectly wonderful time yeah it's, it's, it's one of those movies which is just you know, you talk about movies that are a pure good skill of rock is a pure good yeah never it never does anything unexpected but it does everything right so absolutely right yeah it it, it is one of those movies through and through mm. but it's just kind of a best in type Exactly. exactly. All right. All right. Well, uh, speaking of best in type, let's get to track number two. Uh, this is called My Own Way. Yes. Uh, a counter argument to Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Duran Duran was like, no, no, no. I'm not going to go your own way. I'm going to go my own way. My own way. Uh, and this so is actually also the original idea that was pitched for a uh, burger king and then they were like no no yeah. my own way it's you know have it your way i mean that's sounds better right yeah i i don't want it the way of the person i'm i'm buying the burger from because oh. they're just going to make it bread and a burger there's going to be no ketchup or mustard no, no con yeah because it's going to be easy and they're going to get me out of their face and nah, i don't want that um all right uh enough burger talk Let's uh, hit uh, my own way. Three, two, one, play. Oh. That so, but there is moments where you you can you can literally hear the back and singers going, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're still doing this." Yeah. <laughs> Um, there we go. That was uh, my own way. My own way. Yeah. Uh, not one of the most popular tracks on the album. Totally serviceable. A lot of fun. A lot of stuff going on sonically mm -hmm. on, in this song, uh, as we discussed. A lot of uh, a very synth heavy, uh, yes. as all of the, the the songs will be. But really fun. It's got you know kind of a fun little poppy kind of vibe to it it doesn't it's not going to reinvent the wheel uh mm -hmm. like there are a couple of songs on here they're just like damn like music just wasn't the same after this <laughs> yeah <Man. laughs> you got to, like, the thing is as well is uh, you have to have that you have to almost have that one for the one for the audience one for the band so i think and you know my own way feels like this one's for Duran Duran. like you had yeah. your real we all love that song. You all got it down, you got dirty with it. Love that. But this one's one of ours. And mm -hmm. if you stick with us, we're going to give you another three or four songs that are completely going to change your world. Um, but this one, and the thing is, like, it's still got a catchy chorus. You can imagine people singing that back at a concert. Um, and the instrumentation's all over the place and it's fun and it has, once again, these stomping fucking bass line. Just a great bass line. And it's them doing their thing. They're still refining, even on Rio, they're still refining what will be this like complete pop sheen that's going to come out of them. So they're still kind of being a little bit fun and quirky with it. But at the, at the main point here, they have catchy choruses like, I go my own way. You've got that, like, it's there now, it's in your head. And that's that's all you need is people to be singing the chorus at the end of it. And that's all, does it? So. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I also, I, I, like we talked about as we were listening, I like how funky it is. That song's yeah, got some. Song. Yeah, there's some ass to that song, and I, I dig it. <laughs> some ass to that song. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like a little, a little swivel yeah. in the hips. You kind of have to. You kind of have to when you're listening to it. Mm -hmm. um, like, if you, as the sort of song that if you have no rhythm at all, you could probably still get by dancing tip because there's plenty going on you yeah kind of fake it oh no i'm i'm i'm, I'm actually uh I, i'm dancing to the marimba's beat there's a marimba on there yeah only for one second but. yeah yeah i'm following the just the chimes is where <laughs> i come in uh all right let's let's head to the third track on yes. rio a song called it lonely and yeah right like everybody everybody let's bring the room down uh lonely in your nightmare yeah. is the name of this one Serious. uh spooky even Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's uh let's crank it up uh on the count of three three two one nightmare yeah let's do it i 
<laughs> the night train soon will be making another stop. The um, night train <laughs> promises pain for everyone. <laughs> Set your course for hangovers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. So that was Lonely in Your Nightmare, uh, a song that we both like. It's yeah. a totally good song. Uh, you it's know, less busy. It's busy. Le- there's less going on, but I think you hit the nail on the head. As, uh, whereas in the other songs, you had maybe the bass is driving it, maybe the synth's driving it. This time, Samuel Le Bon's driving it. It's mm-hmm. very vocally heavy. It's, it's dictating absolutely everything, and he's got loads to say on it. It's yeah. still got a really catchy chorus, and it's still kind of earwormy, but at the same time, it's not the... It, it's the Context. Placements of songs on albums are really important. Like, really, really, really important. This is a song you play before you come in with the next song yeah. which breaks your mind. Like, you mean... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, th- yeah, this is the. Yeah, I, l- let's just get to it. Uh, yeah. Like, Lonely in Your Nightmare, totally fine. And everybody likes it. Moving on. Uh, n- track number four, Duncan. Arguably one of their best songs ever written. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Hungry Like the Wolf. Ah, <laughs> yes. Are you ready? Do, 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 Incredible music video. Yeah. Oh, one God, of the yes. best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a banger of a song like this as far as i was concerned when hungry like the wolf aired on mtv and i saw and heard it for the first time yeah i lost my mind duncan (laughs) i was like whatever this is i like this this is the thing this here this is the thing what is it jerandra i don't even know what that is but this is the thing yeah you know, it's like the the meme, like you know, my sexual orientation is hungry like the wolf. <laughs> you know, which is also has the the benefit of being one of the horniest songs you're gonna hear on the record. Such a horny song. Um, but let's waste no more time, Duncan. I, yeah. you know, look, it's nice to savor it, but let's just do this. Uh, on the count of three, three, yeah. two, one, hungry like the wolf. Yeah. And it's straight away, bam! The little laugh, and then... Uh, look, when, when you're sitting on this kind of chorus, Duncan, you don't... Uh, you keep playing it. You, you keep just, playing it. Right, you play it for the rest of the record, and everybody's going to go home happy. Of course. Um, but it's like that's like when you consider the structure of something like uh, Lonely in Your Nightmare, which had like these sections where things were, you know, it wasn't like the most avant garde setup of what they were playing, but there were segments doing other things. And this one, it's back to basics, very much like Rio. Rio did have that kind of elongated interlude section with a sax solo and the guitar did a little solo. Bass player probably had a little solo while he was at it. But it's still very. Like the pop sensibility, the pop rule book, when writing a pop song, you have intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, interlude, and then you either go back to a verse, chorus, or you go back to your chorus. Mm-hmm. And that is it. That is literally all you need to do. That is that is the formula to make a pop song. And guess what? Most of them clock in in between that three and a half minutes and four minute mark. And mm-hmm. that is how you package it up and send it out. And that one, it's what? It's three minutes 40? 341, yeah. And it's great every second of it is amazing <laughs> perfect yeah perfect that's he do eat single yeah it's so good i mean like i said it, it's horny which i really appreciate you've got panting yep. uh it, the the instrumentation is so good on, yeah. on this song focused it's fo- like yeah. the keyboard player like we said before keyboards uh there's an uh, kind of arpeggiated synth going in the background which plays pretty much all the way through it with little little accents that bring you into the chorus and take you out the chorus um, the drummer's much more focused he does he likes those stabs those kind of crescendo stabs just to give it like emphasis at the chorus um, bass doesn't do much in the verse but does loads in the chorus yeah. guitar is thicker sounding you get a lot of like kind of these but these kind of bendy bendy sort of sounds totally works as well and it's just the tits mm-hmm. yeah it, it truly 
like I said, when I saw this uh, video for the first time and those sounds hit my ear ears and yeah. the, you know, Simon Le Bon doing the head <laughs> head bob to reveal the scar on his cheek from having sex with the jungle lady. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened in the history of music. <laughs> yeah, step aside. Hey, Jude, <laughs> have you seen Simon Le Bon fuck this jungle lady? Have you seen Simon Le bon fuck this jungle lady? <laughs> right. That's what the critics said. That was the Rolling Stone review yeah. in 1982. I, I just love this idea of like like those a generation of people that obviously thought the Beatles were the greatest pop band of all time. And then Bob be like that, well, did any of them fuck a jungle lady? I know one of them fucked Yoko Ono, which yeah. I mean in itself is a brave task. But I mean, like, did did they fuck a jungle lady? They did not. Duran Duran yeah. won, Beatles nil. Yeah, how many times in the history of the Beatles? Did they come away with a sex scar running from cheek to collarbone? None. Zero. I mean, None. I haven't seen Ringo in a while, but I don't think so. <laughs> anyway. Oh, whoa. I don't have a scar. There we go. That's a, that's a bit of Ringo. He did the voice of... Like, did you guys get Thomas over there? Thomas? Yeah, yeah, Thomas yeah. Thomas and Jim. In the UK, I don't know who voices over in the in the States. The true fact, um, the original run of Thomas the Tank Engine in the UK, Ringo Starr um, narrates it. Hmm. I think, no that might, I think that might be the case here as well. Like, but that's like that's the, how weird things like that. I'm not seeing Ringo... Like, Ringo gets a lot of shit flung on him as yeah. being like the least talented Beatle. I'm just saying, while the rest of them were all having solo albums, he was voicing over Thomas the Tank Engine. So, I mean, there may be some there may be some validity there. Yeah, well, maybe so, but also, you know, he was still one of the Beatles. He still had an still interesting drum style. Like he did. I, I, hey, I've got nothing against Ringo Starr. Yeah, but he, he uh, <laughs> like they, hey, they got rid of Pete Best. You know. Yes. Yes. What do you want? So. I know what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I'm picking up what you're putting down, Bo. All right. Well, speaking of picking up and putting down, <laughs> let's do some holding back, Duncan. And ah, that's... see, I was like, we can't pick up Rainbow. It would just slide through our fingers. But I see what you're doing. Yep. See what you're doing. So we're going to uh, hold back the rain with track yes. number five uh, on uh, Rio. And let's begin on the count of three. Three, two, one, <laughs> rain. <laughs> And it's synthrine. You feel it? Yep. It's also like they're trying to break up a fight between two women. Hold back, Lorraine. Uh, yeah. Or or you know, telling I mean? uh, SNL superstar Lorraine Newman not to get involved. Hold back, Lorraine. Hold back, Lorraine. Hold. Yeah. Hold. Now. Um, so. But, yeah, so uh, a song about drug addiction in the band mm -hmm. uh, turns into a a fun new wave pop song. Uh, really good, you know. Yeah. It's a good song, and like you said, it's just so sick with bass. I think you and I are both fans of bass. I love like bass guitar. Good bass guitar in music is it's why I love funk music so much. Um, like I, I grew up listening to I've said before I grew up listening to a lot of music from a lot of different like different styles. But the things I acclimated to when I was younger was specifically kind of bass heavy music. Um, so you give me a good bass player, I'm in there. You give me a good bass player that's prominent in the mix. It's the thing that's neglected, especially in the eighties. Like especially with pop music, bass is the thing that starts to lose a bit of the punch in favor of other instruments, particularly keyboards in the 80s. But like when you have a bass player as talented as Duran Duran have, there's absolutely no way you don't have that shining through. And he does, he's, or I, I just, he's an active bass player. He doesn't just follow what the guitarist is doing. Yeah, for sure. No, he is definitely doing his own thing. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, and, you know, like we were saying about the the Cure and Robert Smith, like you know, sometimes uh, what I like about this band is is like you said, they're just gonna throw the bass up front in the mix yep. and just let that be the thing that drives the song. I mean, they're just not your standard like rhythm based band. Yeah, you know? 
Yeah, which I mean, like, it works. Them, it's what makes them interesting. It's what makes them a bit different. And we've got to remember this: like Duran Duran are a pop, pop band. Like this is this is in the era of like within within ten years of this, it's going to be essentially male groups that don't write their own music, that don't well, they just sing and dance. They don't have any of that. It's a producer somewhere or a songwriter somewhere writing the song for them to perform. This is in the days of, like, you've got a pop song, well, you're writing everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the producer in there will help you craft it. He may give you recommendations like, no, remove that section, bring this section in, that needs to be here. And he will help you essentially compose the song. But the song at the end of the day, the credits here, if you look at them, is the band they wrote everything mm-hmm. so th- this is what makes me like, sometimes it can be a bit too experimental and a bit too daring and it, and that song's not a single but then other times it's like yeah this is clearly this is clearly what, clearly what we want clearly what we're doing and clearly the direction of of interest in the, the the industry in particular the fans like this is the one you mentioned it before this is the one where like Duran Duran were there they'd done okay but this is the album that's like, yeah, now they're superstars. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that every song on this record feels like it could have been made by the band that did the first record, especially the B side or, you know, the second yep. side of that yes. particular album. Yep. It all feels of a type. It, it, it It's them. Yeah, but it's again, it's just a, a good producer coming in and being like, we need, we need to strip this down, and and get a little less experimental with it, and figure out what it is that you're trying to say in this song, and then just let's say that it's, it's focus. Yeah, it's like that's literally yes. it's the same thing a good editor does uh, in a movie. Yeah, where it comes in and says, right, so what is the subplot? Like, what does it add to the story, right? Let's just remove that. <laughs> like, like yeah. we do not need that subplot for the story. Sometimes the director's like, no, we really do. And then you watch the director's cut and you're like, no, we really don't. <laughs> yeah. We really don't. Like, sometimes it is. Sometimes the, sometimes musicians are right. But that's what live's for. Like, see, when bands play live, there's a reason that when certain bands play certain songs live, they do a much longer version and they go off a little bit great because that's probably how they envisaged it when they wrote it. And then the producer brings it to, this is what the audience wants to hear. Live, do whatever you want because you've already got their money and they're in the door. Like, they love you at that point. But this is what gets them to buy the ticket to come and see you. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah, you're 100% right. It's It's... The focus is exactly the right word for it. So yep. now that I've said something distasteful to myself, like Duncan's right, uh, let's get to new religion, which is yep. uh, a bit the of a Duncan is right religion. I like it. Pray, bo, pray. <laughs> why? Why do I have Duncan's initials burned into my pelvis? <laughs> like Nexium is that? Yeah, it? <laughs> that's right. I didn't realize it was a D and an M at first. It looked like something else. Uh, like a penis. I don't know why I now no longer have that penis on me. It's now a D and an M. I don't like this. Yeah. He's using some kind of dark magic. Um, <laughs> and as someone, Duncan, who recently saw that Snyder cut uh, of oh. Justice League, uh, not not on my own. Like, I was doing it for a reason. <laughs> and I didn't just buy into it. Um <laughs> But that is another movie where it's like, where was the editor on this thing? It's like the, four hours long, isn't it's, it? Yeah, yeah, it sure ain't is. Nobody got time for that, though. It's I can't recommend it, Duncan. No, uh, I, I wouldn't watch it either. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, I, look, I, I don't care. Like, see, if, see if someone tells me that the original movie was what two hours long, mm-hmm. and I needed an extra two hours to make it better. No, sorry, <laughs> you, you've lost me. Not Zack Snyder. Extra, yeah, 10, not- 15 minutes. I understand adding 10 or 15 minutes to a movie to give it like some scenes a bit more context. Yeah. I'll even give you Midsummer, which adds 30 minutes of primarily like character interactions, which totally work in that movie. If someone told me though, right, here is the two hour cut of Midsummer. Oh, by the way, um, there's a four and a half hour cut. I'd be like, why is there another two? Like, I got the story. It didn't feel like it was hollow or missing anything. Mm-hmm. 
You know what I mean? That half an hour I get from the, the, the director's cut is great because it gives me a bit more of the relationship stuff. But then if someone was like that, well, actually, like uh, Ari Aster needs another hour to, to get you on board with the decisions made in that movie. No, he doesn't. Like, I am there. Like, the Snyder Cut thing is always something that perplexes me. Like, people are just like, yeah, this will fix everything. An extra two hours of cinema. No, it won't. Yeah. It, and it doesn't just spoilers that didn't <laughs> that didn't work uh <laughs> let's put this in bit let's do, like like because someone was talking about like the new thing is release the 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 ears cut of, yeah yeah, yeah. i'm like no let's let's stop releasing longer versions of things please <laughs> like, you know, let's, let's just not buy the blurry put it on the blurry that's fine let's not release it to the general public though my, my exception to this rule is if they said, like, oh, there's a five-hour cut of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'd oh, be like, eh, all right, all right, I'm in. You done that? Have you done that audio bit, Kit? I haven't. I need to. Oh, that's a good time. All right. I'm, a, I'm about wrapped up with the audio book I've been listening to. I was actually just saying this weekend I need to I need to find my next listen, and that's what I'll do. That's the one for you, Bo Ransdell. That is the one for you. I'll tell you what else is for me. New religion, Duncan, not this old <laughs> stuff. And uh, that is track number six on Rio. Uh, so this is a bit of a discussion, the song is, between the ego and alter ego, according to Simon Le Bon. Yep. And that is why when we get to the chorus, you are going to hear a lot of layered voice work, which is a little unusual for uh, this record so far. So on the count of three, here we go. Three, two, one, play. Good. It's pretty good, Duncan. Nick Rhodes having a good time. Mm-hmm. Oh. Once again, more expect like that's an experimental song, right? Mm -hmm. But it still feels like a pop song. For you know sure. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in the previous album, it, it wouldn't have been as well produced. And it would have been a bit muddled. Everything was a bit more on point there, which I think benefits it when you listen to it. Like it's not it doesn't stand out so different from everything else around it that there isn't context when you're listening to it. Um, which is important. Um, because if you get like we said before, when you get those experimental or avant-garde sections, if they are so different to everything else, they can be slightly off-putting. It could be a track that you want to skip over. Um, whereas in that one, it still fits. It has it has a feel of the real album, and that makes it work. So, yeah, it yeah, it's very good. It's clearly again, we're kind of on the back end of the album where it's yep. a little more like vocal and lyric heavy. Yeah. Where it's like them kind of flexing those muscles a little bit. That's not to say that John Rhodes is not just losing his damn mind on the bass <laughs> in every single song yeah. that continues to happen yeah. but yeah it does feel like this is where they're they're showing off not just their disco side but like it's what makes duran duran uh the band that they are is yeah. that you get some weird stuff like you get the the big hits but you also get these kind of thought pieces and you know, like I said, this kind of experimental stuff of Simon Le Bon essentially talking to his id in, yeah. in this song. And it it's fun. It's, uh, you know, again, Rio's a banger of a record. And New Religion, I think, is as far as one of uh, the, the stuff that's like not the big singles on there. Yeah. One of my favorites, actually. I think it's mm -hmm. really fun. I like it a lot. It's good, Bo. It's good. Where uh, we're going next. All right. That's going to be track no number seven. Duncan, it's our last chance on the stairway. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. They're closing it. Don't close the stairway. How am I going to get upstairs? The stairway is going to break. <laughs> <laughs> but it's made of concrete. How's it going to break? I don't know. <laughs> Look, I just shook the guy's hand. <laughs> it's gonna be a bad scene. Railing, <laughs> spilling people over. It, it's gonna be rough. Um, all right, so last chance on the stairway. All the count of three, three, two, one, play. 
Here we go. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, just play it that way. And then when you hear it, it totally works. Totally works because it's just, it's a great bass line. You don't, yeah. you don't overcomplicate it, Flea. Um, because <laughs> he will every time. Um, and John but, Rhodes is, is drinking from that same cup. He, he's, it is like it's a base thing. It's like you have a feel for the rhythm, you have a feel for the song, you know what you're doing, take it for a walk. Mm hmm. And they put it on the record. Um, <laughs> like the, unlike Rick Rubin wasn't in the recording going, ah, can we right. just like, so he gets to walk with it. Well, but because, you know, you've got these kind of soaring synth chords yeah. being played, it's having really that bass it. underneath it. You also don't have John Frusciante playing guitar. Right, Duran right. Duran, which kind of, that's the difference when you have, like, when you have a guitarist who's as talented as that. Like, the guitars, are, like, no offense to the guitars in Duran Duran, but the guitars are maybe the least interesting instrument and i don't mean that they're not good they're very good at what they do but they're they're the most the the least experimental instrument utilized on on duran duran's writing is if anything it's like an inverse it's doing what the bass does on every with every other band it's just kind of keeping a simple structure where everyone else is doing stuff that's over the top on it that doesn't mean it doesn't get a chance to do flourishes of it but it is really it's really about kind of keeping a key, playing a chord, and that's about it with the occasional the occasional solo. And that's the difference maybe here when you listen to that. It's the it's the it's the least inspired, but it totally fits its role. So the drummer can go off and play marimbas if he wants. And xylophones wants like in yeah, less fans. Anything, anything he wants there. Vocally, he can be really playful, experimental, layer all that stuff up. Synth, he can play as many different notes as he wants. And the bass player gets to, to go a bit wild. But that, it fits in the song. If the guitars were doing too much as well, that was what was the problem on the previous album. As the guitarist was taking things for a walk at it as well, and then it was too much happening. You need something contained in the middle to keep the listener grounded to what's happening so everything else can be a bit playful, and that's the guitars on the album. Yeah. It, it, I think it's almost like having no lead guitarist and just a rhythm guitarist. A hundred percent. You know? A hundred percent. Speaking of high percentage uh, songs, Duncan, Whew. let's get to... I mean, again, one of the bangers on this record. Uh, mm -hmm. When it was released, Save a Prayer, our eighth song on the record, is uh, the most popular song that Duran Duran has released. And it was uh, enormous. And it was uh, a contrast to, you know, some of their, like, Rio and Hungry Like the Wolf and that kind of thing. These, these more, you know, if not aggressive, certainly more up beat kinds of songs and then oh, yeah. this and, is a ballad yeah this is like a, this is a stone cold flat out ballad yeah from a band that don't do ballads yep a hundred percent and uh let's get to it on the count of three three two one play oh uh, reverb synth So that he's playing he's playing that synth thing he's using a modulation wheel which sits on a keyboard so basically what it does is it takes a sound and it pitch shifts it mm -hmm. so, which is why you're getting that it sends in key and then it sends out a key it's, all he's doing is fucking with it and he's having fun while he's doing it which i kind of love he's like it's the end of the song <laughs> i'll just make this noise go weird they're like could you just not just keep it just to the end just keep your no 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a like it's one of those songs that uh, and forgive me for sounding a little sexist about this, uh, but when you are discussing uh, Duran Duran with a lovely lady, mm. I guarantee you at some point they will bring up Save a Prayer. Yes, it is just it. There is something about this song that speaks to the female heart, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, look. I'm not immune to it. It had, <laughs> you know, as Laura Dern said in Jurassic Park, I, w I was distracted by its magic too. But, but I think like Save a Prayer is is like the lady song on the record. Yeah. Like we're gonna yeah. we're gonna bring it down for the ladies. 
and but it's great it's a terrific song it's so good yeah i believe the kids call it a banger bull they do yeah this one is fire yeah (laughs) this one is fire so speaking of i recently heard like uh because i did like the other music uh podcast i do uh my best friend recently um (laughs) recently started talking about uh, this song fucks yeah fucks hard and i'm like that yeah and that's the saver saver prayer fucks fucks softly though yeah well right the saver prayer is gonna light some candles Mm -hmm. you know have some wine Mm -hmm. and and then it's gonna lay you down and it's it it's gonna fuck you duncan yeah and it's gonna do it smooth and and (laughs) silky it's the, the kind of fuck that like you're you're surprised by the orgasm like oh shit I'm coming I didn't yeah that one stuck up on me yeah I didn't even expect that at yeah the yeah I know what you're saying Bo. uh <laughs> I'm glad one of us does so <laughs> let's get this lady out here let's call her a taxi oh wait one second this is a stretch limousine with a chauffeur that's right uh it is the final track on uh the the album rio the also chauffeur the worst segue of this episode uh <laughs> look uh I, mine were all written down so <laughs> segue is a segue does both yes <laughs> my, my mom said wherever i was going i was segueing <laughs> so, so let's get to the the chauffeur uh which is the the final track uh let's uh light the candle on this on the count of three three two one play but Uh, yeah oh doors closing (laughs) i don't think there is anything after that i think the door closes now it's just noise noiseless sorry yeah yeah, there and, and there you have it. That is Rio in in its entirety, Duncan. <sighs> um, man, what an album! It's a great album. It's, it's a fucking great album. It's, it's a statement so of intent. Yeah, and this was the album. Like after you know, because they, they've been having trouble getting success in America and that kind of thing. And as soon as Rio comes out. That all goes away because Hungry Like the Wolf and Save a Prayer and Rio mm-hmm. and all those songs just launched them. Yeah. And yeah. uh it, within it, yeah. a year, within a year, we have the reflex. Right, like right around the corner <laughs> is a, a little record called Seven and the Ragged Tiger. Yeah. Uh which is the next thing we'll talk about after we do another season of slasher and that's a penance for having good things as slasher (laughs) but but i i like this because it's such a wonderful cherry on our sunday after getting through season three which we have heard is the worst season at the moment, well, season four hasn't finished yet, but so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I got a lot of questions about somebody making those kind of calls after season two. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, any final thoughts on Rio? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's a lot of what we said. It's the album that really starts to kind of pin down the Duran Duran sound, the one that we you'll be most familiar with. And within a year, they define the sound that will let them go off and write one of the best Bond songs. Um, and all that comes off the back of their next album. But this one, it still it has a little a little kind of hangover of that that kind of experimental side that they were shown on the first, well, the first album. But it's much more focused. It's key as it's pop songs, though. Like that's the, the formula for the first time ever is recreated multiple times on the album. And once they have that in place, especially from Rio moving forward, they, they spin it up with ease. Like every album after this has a centerpiece, absolute fucking incredible pop song. Uh, but Rio's the one that really finds them kind of nailing that down. And it's all to do, it's all to do with choices of of who's producing the album and just them having a bit more confidence in themselves that they can sound exotic. And that's the word that I use when I think of Duran Duran. I think, I don't think of 
England, because they're not from a nice part of England. They're from a grey, grubby part of England. But when I think of Duran Duran, I think colours, I think jet setting, I think, you know, exotic and all the rest. And Rio is the album that kind of solidifies that as, right now, this is a world band, you know, not just an English band. So, Yeah. It, terrific record uh, i can't wait to talk about seven and the ragged tiger in you know three months or whatever um mm-hmm. but uh between now and then duncan uh first of all thanks for to, to everyone who's watched and listened and all that stuff i hope you enjoyed like we i i really love doing these little one-off shows where we just talk about a great duran duran record <laughs> that makes yes. me very happy uh but uh, in addition to thanking you for joining us on that little journey, um, your reward is our suffering <laughs> as in two weeks time, we are going to begin our look at uh, slasher season three with episode oh. one. Uh, and you can join us live every other weekend or, uh, just in, uh, in audio form, uh, every other weekend after that. So, um, that is it, Duncan. The only thing left to say uh, to the fine folks who joined us is uh, say goodnight, Duncan. Say goodnight, Duncan. Oh.